Welcome to Fast Talk Laboratories, your source for the science of endurance performance. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Fast Chats. I'm Chris. This is Trevor, of course. Today we're talking about a fascinating subject, pain. Trevor, you love pain. I don't love pain, but I love <laughs> learning about it and certainly looking at how athletes deal with it. And we've got some new, relatively new studies that are really diving into how elite athletes handle pain. They're looking at ultra endurance marathon runners. These are people that do an event longer than a marathon because pain is inevitable. You might get injured, uh, but if you're doing 50 miles at some point over those 50 miles, you're really going to start feeling it and you have to learn how to push through. So yeah. they want to see how they manage it. Yeah, I only have a little bit of experience in the ultra running endurance world, but I know that pain is just defined differently. And in fact, um, taking the opportunity to reframe things as positives versus negatives. that You get into all these sorts of things when you talk about the difference between how elites and how amateurs sort of conceptualize it and also, quote unquote, deal with pain. Yeah, and it was surprising. You, what, what would you have expected for elite athletes? I mean, I would expect them to just say, oh, my pain tolerance is higher or something right. like that. And that wasn't the case, right? Um, what they really showed. So they do studies where they'll take elite athletes and they'll take a non-athlete and have them put their hand in cold water and, and start giving estimates of the pain and when they feel the pain. And they showed elite athletes no higher pain tolerance than, than anybody else. It's actually quite average. Right. So they feel all the pain. Yeah. But what's different? Their brains are different. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> They've experienced a lot of this in the past, and they have understood how to reframe things. They've understood how to feel like they have efficacy or self-efficacy, meaning they have control over things. There's a host of reasons why their psychology is different. Um, and that's a, a learned thing, as yeah. well as a possibly a, they have been attracted to the sport because they were, quote unquote, born or naturally inclined to think in these ways. Yeah. And that was, so the first review that we talked about was human resilience and pain coping strategies, a review of the literature giving insights from elite ultra endurance athletes for sports science, medicine, and society. Um, mouthful. And it is a mouthful. And they really dived into, is this something that you can learn or is this something that just, you know, people who have this higher ability to cope with pain end up gravitating towards these sort of sports? And they didn't have an answer. They said, there does seem to be signs that you can learn this, um, but it's probably a mix of both. Mm -hmm. But what I found particularly interesting was this other study that was titled The Prevalence and Perception of Non-Steroidal mm. Anti-Inflammatory Drug Use Among Ultra Endurance Runners. And this just came out like two weeks ago. Right. And they went to one of these ultra endurance events and looked at the difference between the elites who do this professionally versus the amateurs who might be doing this for the first time. And they were looking at whether they were using painkillers or not because it's fairly known in this community that taking painkillers in an event like this can actually be very dangerous. It can actually really harm your kidneys. Yeah. Um, so you really shouldn't, but it was something like 60% um, still took them. But the reasons were very different. What you saw was in the recreational people participating in this and kind of for the first time, they basically took the painkillers when they started feeling pain because they just needed the help. They didn't want to, you know, they didn't think they could get through yeah, the it pain. It was a complete reaction to, right. oh my gosh, I feel pain. There's something I can do about that. It's this pill. I'm going to take it now. Right. Where the elites planned out their whole race and they planned out when they were going to take their painkiller. Yeah. And it was entirely performed. Yeah. I feel like they think about it as they do nutrition, hydration. It's a, it's a tool in the toolbox for performance. And if there's any reason that reducing the sensation of pain improves performance, then they will plan it out and they will use that. And that's basically what was concluded. Yeah. They were asked about that and they just simply said, yeah, when I take this, I don't find my performance drops as much. So that's why I'm taking it. It wasn't a, I feel a lot of pain. I need to deal with the pain. It right. was purely performance-based. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So the third study we looked at is this one called, I know you love this title, Pain is inevitable, it's suffering is optional. 
relationship of pain coping strategies to performance in multi-stage ultra marathon runners. And this was a six day event. Yeah. Three marathons in a row, day one, two, and three. Actually four. Four days in a row, right? A double marathon effectively, and then a, a five mile cool down, we'll call it for Which the, for the last, <laughs> you know, hey, do the event and then you might find out why they, the last day is so short. <laughs> this is fair. And they were really looking at uh, whether people dropped out of the event or not. Yeah, it's uh, not so much a, I mean, it is a competition, but it's like people are in it to complete it rather right. than to compete in it, you know, it so was, big. It was interesting what they found, wasn't it? Yeah, there are maladapt the maladaptive strategies would include things like I have a little bit of pain, you catastrophize it, you turn it into a much bigger thing. That's that classic downward spiral. Um, you might also feel something on day three that's hinting at pain, and you might say, I'm averse to pain. I don't right. want it on day four and just drop out of the event. That would so be a fear of pain. Fear of pain would be another maladaptive strategy. Avoid. Yep. And then some of the adaptive strategies, so believe it or not, trying to just ignore the pain is not because you just, you can't, you're going <laughs> to feel do it. it. Yeah. But reappraisal of the pain. So you can say, Hey, this is part of the event. This is part of the experience. This is actually a positive or a lot of elite athletes will turn it into kind of a metric. This is how I can measure whether I'm going too hard or going right. too easy. Yeah. It's also a gauge of performance in that way. Mm -hmm. What were some of the other adaptive strategies? Uh, I think elite athletes do a good job of separating themselves from the pain, but also having this acceptance that it's part of what they do. And in fact, it is in a sense why they do it yep. to some degree, like it's part of the experience. Mm -hmm. So what, I found interesting in the studies, they looked at a whole lot of things that correlated with whether they finished the event or they, they dropped out. Mm -hmm. And they only found two that actually correlated. One was age. Mm -hmm. So if you were older, more likely you were gonna drop out. The other was the maladaptive strategies. If yeah. you employed maladaptive strategies, you were more likely to drop out. Adaptive strategies, didn't really seem to have an impact, which was interesting. It's very interesting. The way I would think about it though, is that denying maladaptive strategies, quelling the, the urge to have a maladaptive strategy is in itself an adaptive strategy. Right. I would agree with that because a lot of the ways you avoid those maladaptive strategies is to use some of the adaptive. Correct. Correct. So I, I agree completely. So yeah, you know, interesting that they say that, but I, I think it's mostly just employing psychological strategies to, yeah, yeah. to handle the pain. You know, going back to the review, uh, I think the other interesting thing that they showed, you again, they were they they kept going back to, is this something that you learn, or do people who just have a really good ability to cope gravitate towards the sports? Mm -hmm. But they did say one thing that clearly you can learn is mental toughness, mm -hmm. and they said mental toughness correlates with your ability to cope with pain. Um, and mental toughness, they they really put two things in there. One was a sense of self-efficacy. The other one was persistence. So persistence is no matter how bad this gets, I'm just going to keep at That's it. That's an easy one to understand. Yeah. Yes. Self-efficacy is that feeling of I have control over my own destiny. Mm -hmm. So that's the, if you're in the middle of the event and you get injured, you know, somebody who's going to, oh, look at my horrible luck. There's nothing I can do about this. This sucks. They pull out. Where the other person might go, okay, I need to slow down. So let's say they injured their ankle. I'm going to bandage up my ankle. They kind of have a strategy for it. They feel they still have control over it. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that as a huge difference between <laughs> elites because of their experience. They have a whole checklist of things. Mm -hmm. If I feel this, then I can do this, or I can do this, or I can do this. And they have the sense of control. They also literally have control. They'll take action to avoid some of the sensations they're feeling. Whereas those without experience are so easily like, oh my God, I don't know what to do about it. This is being done to me, which means I don't have control, which means, you know, like yep. avoid pain, drop out and so on. And what this review talked about, taking that a step further is this whole idea of locus of control, that there are people that feel that, their locus of control is internal. They are the masters of their destiny. 
Well, there's other people who feel their locus of control is external, meaning mm -hmm. the, the world kind of controls everything around them. And they then looked at this outside of the sports arena and said people who have an external locus of control tend to be more passive. When they're dealing with pain, they tend to go to more of a pharmaceutical route mm -hmm. to try to cope with it. And, and some legal, some illegal drugs. <laughs> um, where people who have an internal locus of control are going to be looking for the things they can do to manage this. Yeah. We could talk about this all day. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a fascinating topic. We do talk at length about it in the podcast. So please check that out. And thanks for joining us today.